without any further ado, uh, I'm going to start with uh, the presentation. So I'm going to talk to you around your style pedagogy today. Uh, so just about bit about myself. So I'm a senior lecturer in economics at De Montfort. I'm uh, also a deputy director on the learning and teaching strand for the Doctor of Business Administration program. So I teach a number of professionals uh, um, on different programs as well. So um, the basic idea is uh, I'm trying to develop myself as a learning and teaching specialist, uh, looking at varied pedagogies, why we use them and uh, what is the importance of having a different approaches and not getting absorbed with a standard practices? So throughout the presentation, I'm going to speak around a few exemplar approaches and identify how they interact and intersect with our routine thinking and how could we uh, you know, absorb them to have more effective uh, methods of depicting, especially our uniqueness. And that's the reason why the title, Your Style Pedagogy. So basically, I'd want you to focus throughout in finding the approaches that identify you as a specialist teacher or finding your USP. And sometimes you also say that what is your uniqueness uh, towards when it comes to teaching, which is your unique style of teaching. So uh, often a day's uh, Twitter feed, uh, social media appears, there are a number of, there's no dearth of innovative approaches. So we often go into our social media pages, LinkedIn, Twitter in the evening and see so many approaches uh, being done across the higher education sector. I feel I should have added Elon Musk to this because despite not being on my friend list, he does appear a lot. Uh, I don't know why that happens, but perhaps has reduced uh, uh, in frequency nowadays. So you have people doing uh, using pop culture to teach, uh, especially in my area in microeconomics. Uh, and then you have someone using ice creams uh, to and, and, you know, letting students identify which brand is it. By the way, that would have been an interesting class to attend. Then you have podcasts, use of uh, VWOX. We, we just heard something around the voting technology in a previous presentation. And then you also nowadays have uh, more stress around playful or creative learning and teaching. So I often feel that looking at all these examples, uh, though they're fantastic, but sometimes my day becomes overwhelming thinking, uh, how do I find time to adapt or you know bring in new innovative approaches into my day-to-day -day routine I'm, I'm sure we all have a, a very long to-do list that makes us sometimes do the most urgent tasks and leaving sometimes the most interesting ones behind so how do we identify which which technique we should adopt and how do we find time to you know look at that technique now, over time, I have found answers to these questions by passionately following what I enjoy doing the most. I mean, so my stress always is on the fact that I want to identify myself as a specialist educator and work on those strengths and uniqueness. Obviously, over time, the specialism could change because I could have achieved a particular standard or a benchmark. So what I want you to identify through the presentation is what is your uniqueness and what, what is your unique style? What is your style of teaching? So imagine you could teach in any way, um, but definitely do not overrun the regulations or administrative procedures. So I'm not here to ask you to destruct curriculum, but if you could just imagine that you could teach in any way, what different strategies would you use? How similar or how different your teaching would be? Would you be able to think outside the box and not be absorbed by standard practices? By the way, I do personally feel that this type of, you know, um, reflecting on your on your teaching style also allows us to sometimes understand more closely as to how our students learn and what is the purpose of our subject. So it opens a useful uh, window where you can reflect on different approaches where you can actually reflect on your uniqueness and your your style in terms of uh, teaching and learning. So what I'll do today is in the next couple of slides, I'm going to run through a number of approaches. I won't present a particular example and show the results or outcomes in terms of student performances. 
but I will run through a couple of approaches and look at what are the uh, different pros and cons, uh, what are the do's and don'ts that we should keep in mind when it comes to the different learning and teaching strategies. But before that, why is it important to understand what our uniqueness is? Why is it important to reflect on different teaching and learning strategies? I mean, first of all, we are returning back to the normal. So more than ever, we've we've seen uh, we've had a taste of online teaching. We've had a taste of a bundle of resources being developed and um, you know shared across um, the higher education. We've had a community of practices being formed, such as the one we are act currently sitting in. So, but the landscape obviously has changed. So a dearth of new resources, new collaborations, new community of practices have been formed. So it is perhaps the time when we start um, looking at the different practical resources that have been created, what are the different innovative pedagogies we have, and focus on some of the challenges that we might have faced across uh, those different approaches and strategies throughout the pandemic period, and then identify which are our tools that we would want to use. How do we develop a culture that looks into teaching in our own styled way? So in terms of the more concrete objectives, uh, I'm going to discuss three key ones. Uh, the first one being active learning. Now, these are not new terms that you would be looking at. I'm sure everyone's heard of active learning. Everyone's heard of community engagement. So I'll go one at a time in terms of how I identify or when I look at active learning and when I try to see whether I'm active, when I, whether it's active learning is one of my uniquenesses. So how do I identify the do's and don'ts? So what are the strategies that I use? So when I'm going through these different types and different, you know, uh, teaching styles, I'd want you to reflect on your practice and see whether which is the strand where you think you fit the most perfectly or where you'd like to fit. Where is your passion in terms of uh, these different uh, teaching and learning strategies? So I'm still hoping I'm clearly audible to everyone. Uh, if that's a yes, and there's no further technological glitch that happened in between. Anshul, if you could just give me a nod, please. Yes, that's okay. And we all can Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, so the first one um, that I thought I'll put together was active learning. So Especially active learning is also sometimes an exemplification of inclusivity. So more than just the idea that one size fits all, when we look at active learning, we try to bring our learners together and work around their sort of interests, needs and curiosity. So it tries to identify your learner's needs and match that with the resource and content. So if you're one of those who think that you can involve your learners uh, by helping and make them autonomous learners basically so uh, or you can you know that you'd like to see uh, the way they when the learners interact with the content and see how the results or outcomes work so basically asking learners to become more involved through thinking and creating so it's more like a conscious learning environment that emerges from activity and also based around the philosophy that learning comes when you know you're actively involved in a process so active learning could take different shapes and forms and i'm sure we all do these kind of activities more or less especially something like a flipped classroom has become very very popular given the um you know the interesting videos we the in asynchronous videos we created throughout pandemic so a couple of examples in terms of active learning which is involving your learners into constructing and reconstructing knowledge is could be in class activities could be role play could be problem solving something like a one minute paper where, where when i say one minute paper it often means that you know you ask your learners towards the end of the session you ask your students to identify um you know, one thing that they learned today, one best uh, concept or one of the most favorite concepts or anything like a one minute thought on reflection around the session. Um, even icebreaker activities come as part of active learning. So you could be really, really um, uh, interested in designing something that would allow students to break the ice in the first week when they come, especially for uh, 
sometimes the level six students or the second year students who no had face to face teaching in their first years, but now they're back to campus uh, after pandemic. So any sort of classroom experiments, simulations come as examples of active learning. But when you're looking at active learning, one of the major concerns that comes across is unpredictability. So when I say unpredictability, even though we are trying to engage our students, but it is quite possible that the student refuses to engage. So it is actually a situation wherein you would want to know some answers from the students, but the students are not replying back. And this is quite common. Also, another thing about active learning is it it's why it's unpredictable is because sometimes the students could question your role. I mean, because active learning often makes your role quite passive in a situation. So are you actually teaching? Are you actually interacting with your students or is it most of the work being done in, uh, you know, within within the classroom by the students or by the learners? And often it's also unpredictable because of the fact that you could lose control of the activity. So, you know, you've given a, an icebreaker problem or you've given a role play situation and students tend to interact with one another. So what happens to your role? Do you lose control and does it fit into a large group? Because sometimes active learning, the, the proponents could say it, it works much better when you have a smaller group or when you have a seminar session rather than a lecture session. So those are the kind of unpredictability that gets associated with active learning. And when I look at active learning as one of the teaching and learning strategies, and if I want to identify my strength here, I'd work on these do's and don'ts. So first of all, I always think that is that there is a need to constantly adjust my session. I, I may go in with a particular plan, but then that plan may not work completely. I'll have to adjust it to incorporate the students' reactions, to incorporate the, you know, the class strength, how many students turn up on that day. So adjusting the session is, is really, really important if I'm looking at active learning as one of my styles. Uh, the other thing is that I have to be watchful. I have to be alert. I have to intervene. So I cannot just be very, very passive. So something that stems from the unpredictability that if you are using active learning, if you, you know, delving into a number of activities in your session, then you have to be very, very alert. You have to intervene in the session. Do not make assumptions. So there are definitely and always some of the students who are reluctant to interact. You can try as much, but they would not interact uh, during a particular uh, situation or during role plays or during even an icebreaker activity. So you just ask, you know, tell me about yourself. Even then they would just give you their name. That's all. So do not go in with any assumption. So you could have a situation where an activity could completely um, falsify or, or it could completely fall flat on the face. So have a strategy, have a clear rational. I mean, this particular uh, do I'd say has been really useful for me in the past because I always tell my students that why we are doing something. And I think that's really, really important to build that sort of confidence and rapport with the students. So have a clear strategy and rationale uh, when you're choosing a particular activity and do not ignore a particular type of group. So often we are we could just stand and start, get stuck with a group of students who are interacting a lot. Whereas, I mean, unconsciously ignore a group of students who are not talking at all. So this is one of the don'ts that we shouldn't, uh, we should always remember. And most importantly, I'd say do not ignore the outcomes of the activity. So if you're really looking forward to identifying your style as an active learning um, style, then Please ensure that you know you you keep in mind that whatever the outcomes of the activities are that are shared with students. So maybe through a Padlet wall, collect feedback, talk to your students that this is what we did in the last class, and this is how we're going to use the outcomes of that or results of that in the for the next session. So anything around active learning has to have uh, you know these do's and don'ts. I I think. Uh, to make that session um, really, really successful. The second sort of strand that I wanted to talk around today is uh, community engagement and group work. So 
I often also sometimes refer to this approach as a flexible approach because this is sometimes we confuse that isn't a group work or or you know a group activity would be something very closely related to active learning type. Uh, so for instance, if I let, say flip classroom, yes, that that could be identified in both strands. But group work or community engagement is not just about flipping, it's also about flexing. So especially because of the number of tools and technology available nowadays. So why do we want to compartmentalize our teaching and learning? Why do why can't we just open up, uh, use the tools and you know, equip our students to become independent learners. And that would also complement face-to-face teaching. So if you're one of those who would like to promote any time learning, more, add more flexibility to your teaching through discussion forums, through group works, through webinars, through even podcasting, which is kind of becoming very, very popular nowadays. And you are one of those uh, social uh, and constructivist thinker who would suggest that you know it helps to form community of practice where learning takes place through social social interaction and can in encourage group work among students then this type of style could be for you so because group work or community engagement would not only allow you to connect a, a connect with your students and or vice versa students to connect with you but also with your content and the peers so community engagement and group work is very very essential when it uh, comes to uh, you know constructivist sort of approach where you allow learning uh, by uh, social interaction so and connection to be built not just with a teacher but with the content and the peers but again there's a cautious warning that uh, anxiety is a really big issue when it comes to community engagement and group work i personally have had students who'd come to me and suggest that you know they are really shy to come to the class um, let alone be in a group and talk to their peers. So how do we ensure that everyone in the group or within the classroom is so supportive that positive relationships could be formed? So for that, I feel a a scaffolded approach or skills are needed. So first of all, whenever you have a group work or whenever you are delving into a group activity, try creating a video explaining the brief, right? So tell the students again, why why are we doing a particular task? What does the task entail? So very crisp video uh, that explains the task when it comes to group activity. Also, often the anxiety comes from the fact that it's a, an assessed piece. So I could be a really good student and cautious about how are the others in my group? Would my uh, mark be disturbed because of uh, you know non engagement by someone else, or uh, you know would everyone reply to my emails? Uh, I mean that sort of a thing is always there. So try building a sort of a non assessed initial task where students just get the flavor of how the end result would be and give sort of feedback around that particular tra- task uh, to the students. Arrange, could there be an arrangement for working together? So could you encourage your students to, uh, you know, suggest and try and involve you into their conversations so that if if there is a sort of non-engagement, you could, uh, you know, come in and, uh, you know, consider why the non-engagement is happening. So sort of a culture of, of openness to ex- explore that sort of non-engagement and, you know, kind of a protocol of working together. So in terms of the tools, when I pick group tasks or community engagement as one of the uh, one of the styles that I'd like to develop my expertise around, I kind of go with a few tools with me. So first of all, an agenda for group meetings. Now, I'm not saying you add this as a task to your workload where you have an agenda that you have to take box and exercise every time the students meet, but maybe give them this agenda that every time they meet, they have to you know, uh, distribute tasks among themselves or every time they meet, they have to report back to uh, you know to the group that this is what they've done. So kind of an agenda that's their choice to uh, you know uh, take on board or not. Then there could be targets to achieve. So every time you could give them, you know, you could set up in the beginning of the assessment or the group activity that at the end of the first week, this, you know, your group should have achieved this particular target. So, and the other one could be uh, mapping aims and objectives. So where you have, uh, again, 
you you have to achieve this objective by the end of first week you have to achieve another objective by the end of second week so i just am trying to say that when you have a group activity or when you're trying to build a community engagement among students or a learning network among students they they like to have some sort of concrete um, targets achievable targets with them uh, so that you know a sort of arrangement of working together or a protocol of working together could be developed. And the last point, which I was very keen to uh, talk because is participation points. Often group activities enhanced uh, through gamification or through assigning points and points could mean marks. Uh, so you could have a coursework where if the students, let's say, attain a max of 100 points, those 100 points could mean five marks for that particular group. So see the engagement um, through interaction with you, through interaction with their peers, how the group is progressing. At that time during the classes, you can have a glimpse of their agendas. You can have a glimpse of how they're achieving the different targets and award them points, which could then mean marks. So the last one basically is uh, playful learning, and this is uh, uh, quite interesting because I personally feel I'm an AFOL, which means an adult fan of Lego. Uh, so playful learning comes in different forms, uh, but Lego series play is uh, more recent. It has has its own form, and it's becoming quite popular. And the, and the reason is uh, that. Uh, initially, Lego series play was created uh, to focus within the uh, business and management or leadership context, but it has the capability to cross those boundaries and subject areas. So Lego series play is, is not just about building literal models, but a metaphorical representation to uh, problems and solutions. So idea around this one is so if you identify yourself as an adult who believes in play and who believes that play could add to uh, adult learning then this is a, st a strand for you to explore because uh, you are definitely thinking in terms of dexterity you are definitely thinking in terms of a three-legged stool where the three legs are head heart and hands uh, so and you want to promote creative thinking and finding problems so um Basically, Lego series play allows you to the students to become more self-aware of, of a problem, of a solution. Uh, it allows them to be more creative when it comes to finding the solutions. So as I was saying that Lego series play has the potential to cross boundaries. This is something that I tried my financial market students. I had never imagined that economics uh, often termed as a dry subject, but could be so interesting to use a uh, Lego series play. So uh, we were given, they were given a problem around identifying the core principles of money and banking, and they're trying to identify uh, it through Lego. Now, the first piece, I just want to focus on the first one, is often it's difficult to engage the students in the very first go. So let them explore the pieces, let them explore different pieces. So he, the, that particular student has literally put down every piece in a single way because they were not aware of how to how to give a start. So let them in the first few weeks, let them explore, give them the task and tell them why, why they're doing Lego series play. So the initial push could be required, but must explain the uh, uh, the purpose behind it. Again, uh, one more cautious thing if you're trying to develop your strength here is um, no generalization or stereotyping. So stu students could have their own interpretations. And most importantly, correct facilitation is a really, really important. So I'm just going to take another 30 seconds because I just wanted to uh, leave on this particular note and something that stemmed from my technology, uh, you know, what I've just faced uh, with the technology, my problem with the technology in a couple of minutes ago is do not use a tech or a tool just for the sake of it. So don't make it a gimmick. Um, try including the pedagogic relevance of that tool. So try asking questions around can you explain the relevance pedagogically? Can you justify the tool? So whether you're doing flip classroom, uh, using lecture capture or whether you're using uh, you know any sort of tool for community engagement whether you're doing a sort of gamification stuff so anything that you do please do ensure that you have a pedagogical relevance <laughs>